China. I tell you, that's a little trick I learned while in Washington, D.C. Every time I find it hard to get somebody's attention, I just mention the word China, and everybody goes, what? Where? Including <laughs> my staff all the way back there. Uh, well, thank you very much. First, uh, thank you, Carnegie Endowment, and uh, thank you, Bakri Foundation, for organizing this event. And you know, to be honest, I feel a little bit out of place to be in what looks like a very GQ lineup, you know, with the, I mean, the best looking interpreter in Indonesia, stuff with his pinstripe shoes and everything, so I feel a bit out of place. Uh, but it's, it's great to be here, and this is a great topic, and I want to share a couple points with you today on the top subject of U.S rebalancing in Asia, what has uh, the Obama administration done. Let me begin with this uh, one point. We welcome very much the uh, re-engagement uh, of America with Asia. I mean, the statement and the policy positions made by the US administration, particularly by Secretary of Hillary Clinton, that America will uh, undertake to uh, do a strategic pivot uh, from the Middle East, from conflict areas in, in Afghanistan and Iraq <coughs> towards uh, Asia, is a uh, is a welcome uh, is a welcome statement, and and I do uh, I must say that uh, the Barack Obama administration has made a series of right moves when it comes to Asia and Southeast Asia. They have done the annual U.S. ASEAN summit now. They have signed on to the Treaty of Amity and cooperation after so long. He has agreed to the uh, Southeast Asia nuclear weapon free zone, has had agreed in Bali, although it hasn't been signed yet. He has done policy shifts on question on the issue of uh, Myanmar. Uh, and it has uh, engaged uh, Southeast Asia and Asia a lot more actively, including uh, in its policies towards China. <coughs> now, all this is very important because I think America does need to reclaim some of its space that had been somewhat, uh, uh, not, not lost, but uh, reduced in, 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 the, in recent years in the changing region. I mean, one example is uh, uh, Indonesia's relation with America. Uh, Indonesia's trade with America is about $23 billion annually. Uh, but with China, uh, where the relationship, trade relationship was very minimal uh, a few years back, we have crossed 20 billion mark, we have crossed the 30 billion mark, and now we're aiming for this 50 billion mark. Another example is education. 20 years ago, there were about 14 Indone 14,000 Indonesian students studying in the United States, and almost zero in China. But now, uh, there are more Indonesian students studying in China. It's about 8,000, and studying in the, in the US is about 7,000. So again, there are some spaces, political, diplomatic, economic spaces, uh, that America needs to reclaim in Southeast Asia and, uh, and in Asia. There was a feeling that America had been too bogged down in Afghanistan and in Iraq and in other places. And while all this happened, Asia changed and changed faster. Asian, ASEAN plus three happened. ASEAN with Japan, China, and South Korea. ASEAN community happened. East Asia Summit happened. The Bali Democratic Forum happened. The Trans-Pacific Forum happened. Again, all this without the involvement of the United States. So it's not necessarily the US is becoming slower, but the others and the region is becoming much faster. And we need to keep up with it, and we need to plug in to it again. Again, the term used by President Barack Obama the term of re-engagement is very important. And this is happening at a time when everybody's capacity to reshape the regional architecture has increased considerably in ways that was never seen before. So it's the right time to re-engage. What you must keep in mind is that what you see will be a new Asia. Right? Uh, even Asians feel this. Uh, there's an excellent report by the Asian Development Bank, uh, it's called the Asian Century. I would urge you to uh, get a hold of it. Uh, and that report predicts that in 2050, Asia already accounts for about half of the world's trade and investment. But in 2050, there will be 
3 billion more people added to the middle class in Asia. 3 billion more, not 3 billion, but 3 billion more. The uh, total GDP will be $161 trillion under good scenario. And there will be no poor country in Asia, and about every country in Asia at least will have a living standard similar to what you have in Europe today. So that is the Asia that is forming now. You know, you see a lot of confidence, a lot of dynamism. Uh, Vikram is, is very right, and this is in contrast to declining confidence that we see in Europe. And we think and we hope that this is something that will be for the long term. But in that new Asia, you see a lot of diplomatic repositioning, a lot of, a lot of diplomatic rebalancing. Uh, countries that were not there before now are quite uh, up there and doing uh, a lot of things. So a lot of repositioning uh, and a lot of rebalancing, not just uh, by America into the region, but among countries in the region. Let me try to highlight in this new Asia, what are the geopolitical trends that is relevant that has been ha happening in recent years. First geopolitical trend is you see a realignment of interests throughout the region. Again, this is something that was released and unleashed since the Cold War crumbled uh, globally and especially in Asia. You see relationships being de-ideologized. You know, if you see relationships in the 60s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, ideology is very much a factor in foreign policy relationship between states. But now, if you see throughout Asia, maybe except North Korea, the relationships have been de-ideologized. And this produced a lot of impetus for convergence of interests. Although there's still a lot of divergence of interests, but the, the space, the area for convergence of interests have been enhanced significantly. Uh, this is reflected also in Indonesia's foreign policy. Now we have strategic partnerships with many major powers in many countries. With the United States, we have a comprehensive partnership. With China, we have a strategic partnership. With India, we have strategic partnership. With Korea, with Australia, with Pakistan, uh, with South Africa, with Brazil, and others. But this proves that we have a new foreign policy environment where convergence of interest dictates us to engage into more partnerships. And the fact that now we face a lot more time fighting and dealing with non-traditional threats also matter. You know, Indonesians don't mm -hmm. think that there's gonna be a foreign country that will invade Indonesia, right? I mean, we're quite realistic about this. And a lot of our security issues are cross-border transnational issues, be it terrorism, be it uh, 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 natural disasters, uh, people smuggling, and so on. Right. So the na nature of the threats have changed, and again, in addressing these threats, the, 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 the risen debt to engage in more cooperation is much greater. The second regional trend that, that, that is strong in the new Asia is the rise of regionalism, particularly in Southeast Asia. You know, uh, if you ask ASEAN countries what they wanted to do since they came to form, it's always saying, look, we don't want to be objects of the major powers. We want Southeast Asia for Southeast Asians. We want to be masters and subjects of our own region. That has always been what ASEAN is all about. And this is where we are now. We've come a long way. You know, you look at a lot of the things that has happened in the region, a lot of it has been done by the regional countries. The ASEAN community, the expansion of ASEAN from six, from five to six to 10, uh, the resolution of Sifad and Libitan disputes, the management of Thai Cambodia border, the ASEAN free trade area, uh, a lot of things, uh, the resolution of the conflicts in the southern Philippines. A lot of these things were done by Southeast Asians and without involving America, without involving China or India or other countries. And it is good, it is good for the region because the regional countries are saying we can deal with this on our own. And I think it's part of healthy regional maturity that is happening and something that we should uh, encourage and advance more. Third geopolitical trend that is significant is China's inroad into Southeast Asia. Right? It has been, I think if you ask me what is the most important geopolitical development in the last 10 years, it is China's diplomatic economic inroads into Southeast Asia. 
It is very significant. And you see it in the numbers of trade, you see it in the numbers of investment, you see it in the numbers of Chinese tourists and Chinese workers, Chinese factories, uh, Chinese diplomatic initiatives that uh, engage the region. And I say this not as a negative thing. I think it's good for the region. It's good when it is based on uh, strengthening the regional order and improving relations with countries in the region. And it's good when it leads to more investment, more trade, and investment, and other uh, cooperation. Uh, we in Indonesia have a term called competing for peace. And this is what we ask China and the US and other major powers to do. Don't come here competing for power and influence, because then you polarize the region. But you compete for peace and prosperity when you compete over who has the most students, who has the most technology, investment, and trade. Everybody wins, right? And in fact, we want you to compete even more for peace and prosperity. So that is the third geopolitical trend. Fourth is the proliferation of partnerships. Again, this is something that is very significant and something that has never happened in the region before. Now, what do I mean by this? You take every country in the region, right? Probably about 18, 20 countries, and you draw lines among these X and Y columns and find out which has actually some kind of bilateral partnership treaty or trilateral or regional partnership treaties with one another. And you will see the boxes full with check marks. And if you s compare this to the list 40, 50 years ago, you would see a lot of empty boxes, right? But the point is partnership diplomacy now is very prominent in the region. It's, uh, it's changing the face of the region. I know America's engagement in the region is centered on the concept of alliances, you know, with Japan, with Korea, with Australia, and so on. America still thinks in terms of alliances, but for much of Asia, no one really thinks about alliances, right? People think in terms of diplomatic partnerships and economic partnerships, and this is a diplomatic mindset that is strong in Indonesia, in ASEAN, and throughout the region. The fifth geopolitical trend that I see is the rise of emerging powers. Again, this is not particular to Asia, but this is particular to the global theater. Uh, you see this reflected in the transformation of G8 to G20. Uh, you see this in what I think is one of the most significant diplomatic trends, which is the creation of diplomatic spaces among emerging powers, among Indonesia and China, China and India, India and Brazil, Brazil and uh, Mexico, Mexico and South Africa, all, and Turkey as well. Among all these emerging powers, new diplomatic and economic and political spaces are create, being created very, very uh, strongly and in a very fast way. Uh, you can see it in the number of trades and investments, also in the number of diplomatic partnerships that is uh, happening. Uh, and this means that there's bound to be a new dynamic equilibrium in the Asia Pacific to accommodate uh, and address the rise of these <coughs> emerging powers. It also means, in our view, that the Indian Ocean uh, will become a more important strategic and economic theater. Uh, my president, President Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono, has spoken about the Asia Pacific century uh, in Hawaii. Uh, I think partly in reply to the notion of the Pacific century. Uh, whereas the Pacific century focused on the Pacific Ocean, the Indonesian concept of the Asia Pacific century focused on both one Asia, including China in it, and America as drivers of the 21st century, but also as Pacific Ocean plus the Indian Ocean as the key uh, oceans of strategic, uh, geostrategic regions of, of the world. But again, the rise of the emerging powers will change the weight and the dynamics of uh, this region. Now, one thing that I know the United States will find comfortably as, we, as it re-engage in the new Asia is what a phenomenon that is called the rise of the individual. Again, I don't mean to be philosophical about this, but this is a very real development. Uh, the uh, middle class will rise, but what is different this time is that every individual now is becoming more than just a boat, more than just a consumer. Every individual now with the social media, media tools of Facebook, Twitter, email, websites, 
bloggers and everything, will become actually a voice and a force. You know, we've been quite amazed at what the individual can do these days. I think what happens in the Arab Spring attests to the fact that individuals are really becoming a force in ways that was never before, right? So, and the rise of the middle class throughout Asia, Indonesia already has the largest middle class in Southeast Asia, will be a very relevant geopolitical factors. You know, you ask me what is the most powerful geopolitical force in the 20th century, I would say it's nationalism and democracy. So you change the political landscape. But I think the 21st century, it's not big ideas, but small gadgets that will be the very strong geopolitical uh, force, you know, handphones, fax, uh, emails, twitters, you know, all these small gadgets are changing the way individuals perform and changing the concept of boundaries and international uh, relations. And what this means for Asians themselves is this. We have always been transfixed on the concept of community. You know? uh, I grew up in that kind of intellectual and political environment. Western is about individual, and, and, and uh, Asia is about the community. But with the rise of the individual in the 21st century, every Asian nation will have to get more used to the notion that it's not just the community, but there has to be more space for the individual. Whether you're Chinese, Indian, or Indonesian, or Vietnamese, or Myanmar, the notion of community must start to give more ways and more room and more space to the individual. So finally, as a conclusion, let me give some concluding thoughts on what we should expect and what to be done. I think for ASEAN, uh, I'm, uh, you know, I like sports, and I think a good metaphor for ASEAN as it does the regional architecture, is to think regional architecture not so much in terms of volleyball, you know, non-contact sport, very polite distance, but more like rugby, you know. Uh, and I feel this at Bali in the Asia Summit, uh, especially what Doug described as how we dealt with South China AFC issues and other issues, that, uh, you know, there's a lot of contact. Uh, and for ASEAN, I think the challenge is how to deal with the weight, the enormous weight of China and the enormous weight of America, which will want to have its agenda included, and how do you manage that, right? So ASEAN should be more used to this contact sport and more rugby than, than volleyball. <laughs> for America, for America, look, think of the world, and especially Asia Pacific, not as football. You know, you have American football, yeah, the one that we throw, but soccer, right? You know why? Because, you know, it's the one sport where you really have to earn your place in the world. Everybody is getting good, everybody is great, and, you know, you really have to earn your place to be good in the world of soccer. I mean, you're already great in football. Right? <laughs> <Everybody>. <laughs> I don't want to say it's really, right? <laughs> but, but again, think of it as soccer, where you really have to train and practice hard and try to make it into the World Cup because everybody is really training hard and everybody is very uh, uh, talented. Uh, there's going to be a lot less room for unilateralism, no matter what, uh, what, what your circumstances are. There's going to be a lot less room for unilateralism. There's going to be a lot less appetite in Asia for the politics on confrontation. And there's going to be plenty of space for new players and new thinking. And my last point about America is that, look, we're going to be going into election in the next one year. But remember, this election is not just about America. This election is also about the world, right? Uh, I know it's easy to think that it's just about America, but it's not. I think the world is watching very closely what every candidate is saying. And it is important that you project, every candidate projects that you are not retreating from the internationalism that has always been the hallmark of America's foreign policy. It is very important that you do not pit nationalism against internationalism. Because in today's world, as China has discovered, as Indonesia, India, ASEAN has discovered, nationalism and internationalism go hand in hand. And that is the one lesson that at least the United States should be able to apply in our region. Thank you very much.